I am so privileged to be able to minister to you this morning in uh, week nine. Can you believe this? Week nine of this series. No, put put this put this, that that uh, slide again. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Can you look at the screen for one second? Help me out, please. Please help me out. Please put your phones on silent. Um, you know that I was. You know that I used to pastor a church in TJ, and uh, it's a different culture. And I know we're Latinos, right? We're Latinos on this side and on that side. But in TJ, it's very, very, I guess, appropriate that the kids remain a lot of the times in the service. At least in the church that I pastored, sometimes the mom would keep the children in the in the auditorium, and sometimes they would just jump and scream and. I, I just kept on preaching. Nothing could stop me. I mean, when I get going, I just get going, right? But the thing is, it does, it does distract, not, perhaps not me, but that phone or that kid or something may distract your neighbor. And we want to we be polite. We want to make sure that we're not rude. And, you know, if you need to take a call, I understand. Please do it very uh, respectfully. And step outside and take your call and return and let's get about the business of the word of God, right? So please turn up your phones. But week nine of week 10 of 10 part series, Growing in Grace. We have covered just about every aspect of what grace is all about. There, uh, Chris, do me a favor. Take this and just give it to my lovely wife. <laughs> we have covered just about everything. If there's something that is going to change, that is going to change your life, is the grace of Christ. Amen. See, we're going to study in a few minutes. There's nothing you can do that can bring about serious change in your life. It may work for a little bit. Some of the changes that, that we want or that we implement in our life will help us for a little while but they don't produce lasting change. There is a, this morning's topic has to do with individuals growing with people that are common people, I mean, común y corriente, just common, ordinary folk who want to make a change, who want their lives to change. But how does grace and growth work together? How do we marry the two terms in a way that is biblical and in a way that we can understand it. Well, I'm going to tell you, first of all, what growth is not, right? Growth is not, number one, it's going to be in your outlines, grace or growth, rather. Growth is not how many. It's not how many verses you memorize. Because a lot of us think, well, I'm going to memorize 50 verses this year, and that's going to bring growth. And not necessarily. See, growth is not how many meetings you attend in church. That's not necessarily growth. It's not how many minutes you spend reading a book, doing stuff for God. See, it's not how many of the activities that you do that you think that are God-pleasing that's going to bring growth in your life. Really? No, it's not. Rather, growth, right? See, because often we make the mistake of thinking that if I do Many more things, many more meetings, many more chapters, many more books. There's going to be a growth in our life. And, and I know that everybody that is sitting in this place is here because you're looking for something. Like when you go to a store, I used to work in a store, and, and customers would come in, and, and, you, and, and they're looking at, let's say, appliances, and you ask them, can I help you? And they say, no, I'm just looking. I don't know how many people get up in, you know, early in the morning and they say, well, I'm going to go to Home Depot and I'm going to go just look at appliances. There's something they're looking. If they're looking at appliances, they're probably looking for a washing machine. They're looking for a dryer or they're looking for a range just in time for Thanksgiving, right? They're looking for something. If you're sitting in the chair this morning in this place, my friends, you just didn't happen to be here you're looking for something. That something may be growth, but it's not how many meetings you attend. It's because sometimes we, we confuse and we think that just by doing many more things, we're going to grow. 
Now, growth, when you look at the Bible, growth is this. Growth is how much. It's not how many, but rather how much. How much more is my life yielded to the will of God? How much more am I being transformed by the word of God? How much more do I love my neighbors? And it begins with your family. How much more, how much more is my character being transformed by the power of God? See, it's not a matter of quantity. It's a matter of quality. There's a lot of people that come to church day by day, but there's no growth. God didn't give us his grace. And by the way, you know that grace is a gift. It is not something you buy. It's, it's not a transactional relationship, Grace. It's something that has been bestowed upon you. It's been given to, by God for your benefit. Grace is not transactional. It is a gift of God. And we have a hard time understanding this because we have learned, maybe we've been taught by our parents, by the system, that there's... There's nothing that we're going to get unless we give something in return. And we come to Christ thinking that this is a transactional relationship. My friends, it is not. Growth does not happen by transaction. It's allowing the Spirit of God to empower you so you can be changed by the Holy Spirit. This process is one where God wants to work in the most, in the littlest of details in your life. So your entire life can be transformed by his grace. This process begins by grace. It's a gift. But not only does it start by grace or it begins by grace, it continues by grace. I'm going to step down for a second. We all lived in darkness. We all were doomed to live in eternal damnation, alienated from God. For the wages of sin is death, right? I think we talked about those two verses a couple of weeks ago. And we all also in Romans, everyone was disconnected from God, destituted by God, doomed to be away. This is going to sound horrible, but I have to say, we we're going to be in hell if it wasn't for God, sending his son, Jesus Christ, to save us. So God sent his son, right? Check it out. God sent his son. We were in the pit. We were doomed to be dead forever. And then God, by grace, he pulled us out and rescued us. And now we are saved. But what we failed to realize is that we not only were saved by grace, but we have to continue in that grace if we are going to grow in, the, in that and allow the image of God to develop to the character of Christ as he desires in our life. Look at 2 Peter 3.18. And it's not 2 Pedro, it's 2 Peter. But you get it, right? Pedro is Peter, just so you know. 2 Peter 3.18 says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Is God expecting me to grow? What do you think? Making a little pause. Everyone is very silent this morning. Does God expect you to grow? How many parents are here this morning? Lift up your hands, please. I have four children of my own, right? When you have children and you bring them home and you change their first diaper, you hope very soon that that is going to end. Because it's not the, right? It's not the most fun things to do. Especially when you're changing the diaper and that kid at that very moment decides to do his little trick, right? I know that happened with one of my children. He was incredible. At, every time we changed him, he decided to, I'm going to say, it, to, do, to, to, to do a number one when we were changing the diaper. It was horrible. But you expect that child to grow. All of us, all of us in this place are children of God. We were born into the kingdom of God, right? But God expects us to grow. You cannot be a baby all your life, Tommy. At some point, you have to mature. At some point, brother, you need to stop wearing a diaper. 
And I'm speaking in spiritual terms. Peter is telling the church, you need to grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This morning, the message is very simple. We're going to look at a three-part process on how do we grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The base text we're going to use is found in the letter to the Ephesians, chapter 4, and I'm reading verses 22 to 24. It says, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. This three-part process begins, number one, the number one thing you do in this process is you put off the old. You put off the old. And I took that quote at the wrong time. It, could have been, it would have been a great illustration. Let me see that quote again, please. Chris, can you bring me my coat? I, I, just, I just thought of something right now. The Bible tells me that I had a former way of living, a former way of doing, a former lifestyle. And the first thing that I need to do, the, 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 I thought you did something, Chris. The first thing that we need to do when you come to Christ if it's all messed up, I know it is. The first thing we must do when we come to the Lord is we need to get rid of the old self. So many times, church, look at me for one second. You are trying to do things the old-fashioned way, Tony. And it doesn't work. We try to bring about growth in our life, Alexandra, the old way, and it doesn't work. God is telling us, put off the old. It doesn't work. You've tried so long and you're not changing. You're not growing. Stop. The first thing we do in that old way of doing things as we numero uno in your outlines is we try to grow by doing good. And we've all done it. I've done it. If I can do so many good things, pastor, I'm going to be a good boy. I, 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 I was a youth pastor for a long time. Trust me. So many, Pastor, I've been so good this week. And, and yeah, I, I go, great job. Great job, right? But is that going to bring growth in your life? Is it going to bring really lasting growth? And we tell ourselves, if I could just do enough good things, then I'm going to grow. And, and, and we have this approach to life because we think that change that is going to happen if we do something good. And we're not, we're not the only, we're not the first generation of believers that think that doing good is going to bring growth. Jesus dealt with this attitude with his disciples. In Matthew 9, 17 tells them, Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And you're saying, Pastor, what are you talking about a wineskin? What's up with this whole deal with the wineskin? You may not know, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to explain to you exactly what this passage means and how it relates to us as believers that are wanting to grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Back then, people would put wine into a wineskin. It was literally a vessel where you could put wine, and they would let it ferment, and as they let it ferment on the inside, they would put the wineskin in a place that was somewhat protected, but sometimes the sunlight would ruin, not ruin, would, would dry up the, the leather or the skin. But by the time this happened, the, the wine skin was already expanding, was growing because the process of fermentation allows that or makes that happen, right? The wine skin would stretch. So when, that, when the process was done, they would take out the wine, enjoy the wine, get happy, have a party, right? It was normal. It was part of life. But then if you took that old wine skin and tried to put some new wine into that skin, what it would do, it would fill the wine skin, 
but the new wine will start to grow again and it would make that old beat up, dried up wineskin burst. And now you ruin the wineskin and you ruin the new wine. How does that relate to us? When you come to Christ, but maybe in the beginning, trying to do a few good things will work for a little while. But you leave no room for growth. And what's happening in our lives as believers is that God wants you to be growing and stretching. That's why sometimes God will bring a difficult time into your life. That's why sometimes God will bring a problem. Because those problems are allowing you to stretch and to grow in the grace of the Lord Jesus. If everything was easy peasy, you would never grow in your character development. Look at those problems that you had a few years ago. Maybe last month. It made you a better you. That's exactly what this verse is talking about. Sometimes, sometimes it looks like if I could just do enough good things, I'm going to grow. That, that will work but there's no room for genuine change in that. See, we cannot grow by just simply doing more good things. The second thing, the second thing that we try to do, not only do we try to grow by doing good things, we also try to grow by keeping the rules. Now, in no way, shape, or form, I'm saying that rules are not necessary, okay? Rules are good. Rules are have a place in everyone's life. If you have little ones, Lionel, you need to have some rules. Mijo, you need to pick up your table. Mijo, you need to make your bed, right? If you didn't have any rules, that would be a wrong thing. We all need rules at a certain time in our lives. Thinking about, I'm thinking about Victoria. I'm hoping you have some rules. Little ones need rules. We all need rules at a time. But change does not come by keeping the rules. Look at Hebrews 13, 9. It says, it is good for our hearts to be strengthened by grace, not by ceremonial foods, which are of no value to those who eat them. And let me read you. I put a note here in my, in my iPad. Read them the New Living Translation. Let me read you this verse. Keep it on the screen, Micah. Don't change it. Hebrews 13, 9. Let me read you in this other version. I love how it, it's, it's a little more 2022. Do not be attracted by strange new ideas. Your strength comes from God's grace, not from rules about food which don't help those who follow them. We have been we have been distracted by thinking that growth comes from keeping the rules. Now, you say, well, Pastor, what about the Ten Commandments? Aren't they in the Word of God? Didn't God give rules to His people? Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more this morning. God gave us the Ten Commandments. God gave us rules. There are rules in the Bible. We can never deny that. But let me give you why, the, how the rules, how the rules and grace work in conjunction. Because they're, they're not in opposition. They work in conjunction. The rules in the Bible, let's say the Ten Commandments, they provide direction. They tell you what you should be aimed at. Look, this is where we want to head. And grace gives you the power to work towards those rules, which not, they're not going to change you on the inside. They simply, those rules give you direction. But growth comes by being empowered by the grace of Christ. See, trying to use rules as your means for growth spiritually, it's called religion. It's so quiet in here. I can hear the fan. Something has a fan. I can hear it. And listen, my friends. Well, aren't we Christians? Aren't we? Isn't our religion Christianity? Absolutely, yes. If somebody asks, what's your religion? I'm a Christian. Fine. Me too. But religion has no power to bring about true change in the lives of people. 
Look at how many religious people we have in the world and they're rotten on the inside. It doesn't work. We are changed by the grace of God from the inside out. Religion is trying to make a bunch of rules about my relationship to God and thinking somehow that's going to produce growth. It doesn't. I've tried it. I try to keep all the rules to be a good church boy in my own strength, and I failed miserably. It is only when I am allowing the grace of God to transform me that I can see that growth is really happening on myself. And the third thing that we do is we try to, we try to do good things, we try to keep the rules, but also we try to grow by feeling bad. We think, oh, you know what, I feel really guilty. You know, I, we, we feel like if I just feel bad enough about myself, maybe I'll get better. That's not what God intends you to do. God doesn't want you to walk around, oh, yeah, I'm a bad person. You know, I, I fail so much, that's why. And you want people to feel sorry for yourself. God doesn't intend you to live your life like that. It, he doesn't. He wants you to realize what he has done for us. Romans 8.34 says, who then will condemn us? My friends, listen. If you are in Christ, no one can condemn you. Only the devil is called the accuser. Nobody can condemn you. This, no, no one for Christ Jesus died for us and was raised to life for us. If the only person that accuses the children of God is the devil, the Holy Spirit will bring conviction of something that is wrong in your life, but he will not accuse you. He will remind you that if you are in Christ, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There's no condemnation. So, so stop feeling guilty trying to do good, trying to keep the rules, because it doesn't work. It's just not going to bring change. What works? What is the one good thing? Where do we start by making true progress in the growth that we want? The second thing that I want to share with you then, if we are to put off, like I already took off, that was old, right? I already put it aside. I know it's not working. Trying to good thing, do good things, it doesn't work. It's right there. Trying to keep the rules, it doesn't work. Okay, I took it off. Trying to feel guilty, it doesn't work. I already took it off. What can I do? A lot of us are great about putting off the old, but then we stop there, and it's, that, that's, that's not God's way. We put off the old, but then we put on the new. There's a new life in Christ. If you did this and you're no longer doing it, there's something else we need to do. There's something else that God has in store for us. And if you don't believe me, look at what the Word of God says in 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old, the old has gone, the new has come. There's, some, there's a newness of life. There's a promise for those who, of us who are in Christ that, have, that we have entrusted our everything to Jesus. There's two things that I want to point out as, as, as we realize that there's something we put on. The one thing that I want to point out before I tell you how you're going to do this is that in this newness of life, we don't have to earn it. It's already been paid for. Somebody already paid. I don't have to make it work on my own because in, as you are a new creation in Christ, as, God, as you are a new creature in God, you don't have to make it work. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to take out your credit card and say, look, I'm going to pay for it. No, it's already been paid for. The second thing that you don't have to do in this new self is that we don't have to keep our new life. When I was working with youth, you know the youth have a lot of temptations. So do, so do the older folks. I think if you're a little bit older, we still get tempted in a lot of ways. But the youth are good about being more 
I guess they're just more open. You see, see the, the older we get, we begin to hide, and we begin to be a little more discreet about those weaknesses and the, the areas where we fail, right? But I know that some of the youth, when they mess up, they say, oh, I messed up, man, Pastor, I messed up, I, you know, I was... I was, you know, I was with this crowd, and you know, I just let myself go. It, you know, it was peer pressure. I mean, we've all done stuff out of peer pressure, right? People, ah, now you want to do it. Now you, you, you do it. Young people do that. It's expected of them. Don't do it as often, but I mean, it, they're young people. When you're older, you don't say anything. You just keep your mouth shut because you know. And I know that I, when I was dealing with some of these youth. They would tell me, well, Pastor, you know what? I don't want to lose my salvation. I don't want to lose my fellows. And I go, look, look, look. I go, chill, first of all. Relax, relax. I go, you have lost a little bit of your fellowship with God, but you're not lost. You're not going to hell. And, and you, you may say, well, Pastor, you're minimizing the effects of sin. Relax. I'm now telling you, relax, chill, okay, relax. What I need to do is, what I, what I did is I reassured this young person that they had a slip or they had a fall. And my job as the pastor was not to squash him down, but to lift him up and tell him, Mijo, you're not keeping this because of your own strength. You are being kept because your life is hidden in Christ and nobody can take you from his hand. And, and I'm going to prove it to you by reading Colossians chapter 3, verse 3. And I would say, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. That means that nobody can take you. Like, I have, I have in my pocket two mints. I have one mint. The other one is right here. I put it in my pocket. And I dare you to try to take it from me. No. <laughs> ah. It is right here. Nobody can take you. Your life is hidden. It's hidden with Christ in God. And don't ever forget, like this illustration that I'm giving you. God says, nobody can. But when we put on the new, we think that we are the ones that are responsible. No, God hid you with Christ in God. When it comes to your security, your salvation, your new life that God's given you, it's hidden with Christ in God. So we don't, we don't get to earn our new life. We don't get to keep ourselves on our own life. But we do, we do have to put on this new life. And what does that mean? There's a decision that you need to make every single morning when you seek the face of God. Every single morning, you decide that you will walk in this newness of life. Every single morning when you open up your eyes, and this morning all of you slept one extra hour, and that's a blessing from God. I completely forgot last night about the time change. Completely. I set my alarm at 5.15 in the morning, right? And, and, uh, I went to bed at 10.45, said, I go, eh, it's going to be, it's going to be at least six hours. I, I'm, I make sure that I'm well rested when I come to speak, because when you preach, and those that, of you that are preachers, you know that it is draining. It, it, there's a lot of energy that is exerted when you minister, right? So I want to be well rested. I don't go to bed at 2, 3 in the morning on a Saturday. I'm, I'm throwing some messages out there, subliminal messages. Don't go to bed at 2 or 3 in the morning. Come to church well rested so you have energy, right? But as I was, I set up my alarm. I woke up this morning before my alarm. And I'm thinking, what's happening? Because, and I realized that I'd slept an extra hour. It was a blessing from God to wake up this morning. But when you wake up every morning, you have a choice. Say, I have a choice. Louder, I have a choice. Yes, you do. You make a choice to put on the new or to put off the old. If you want to grow, 
in Christ, if you want to grow in the grace of Christ, you will put on the new. You will allow God to change you from the inside out as you, look, and you may say, well, this being really, I'm not, no, it's not being religious. When you open up this book and you start reading it, something happens. You think you're reading the book. But the book begins to read you. And if you, you know what happens? This book begins to be like a mirror. James said it's like a mirror. And you look at it and you say, God, I need you. I, I'm, gonna, I'm in Psalms 34, okay? I'm going to read verse 12. Does anyone, does anyone want to live a life that is long and prosperous? Then keep your tongue from speaking evil and your lips from telling lies. Turn away from evil and do good. Search for peace and work to maintain it. When I wake up in the morning and I put on the new, I realize that word is going to bring change in my life. Well, because what Paul is instructing us to do is to grow in the knowledge and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And many times when God, and I'm going off script right now. Boom, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm just going gonna, gonna to ride the wave. Sometimes God wants to speak to you because he wants to change something and you are not able to discern the voice of God because you don't know how the voice of God sounds. And you don't know if it's your thoughts or if it's something that somebody said, because we need to fine-tune Ricardo, our ears, to the voice of God. And we learn to listen to the voice of God by spending time in the Word of God. See, most people struggle with this because they don't want to get involved in the process. And yes, it takes time. It's not an easy process. Toma esfuerzo. It takes effort and dedication. Most people say, well, it's tough. I would love to do that, Pastor. It's a great idea, but I have a really hard time letting go of some of those old things. It's hard seeing myself in the new way that God wants to see me. That's why, listen, that's why doing this requires the third step that I'm going to share with you. Because the third step gives you that, that power to really bring about change. The third step is the energy that allows you to be empowered and move in the right direction. The third thing that we do, the, th the third step in this three-part process is renew your mind. When you, change, when you change your mind, young people, for example, I have a row of young people in the back. I have a row of young people in the back. Escúcheme, por favor. When you change the way you think, you change the way you act, you change the way you live in everything. We have people that live defeated lives because they have thoughts that are defeated. But when you change the way you think, you change the way you are, you change what you do, you change your life. Paul was so passionate that he writes to the Romans in chapter 12, verse 2, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. If, if you have a, a custom to, to, to circle out the outline or, or in your Bible, circle changing the way you think. There's power when we change the way we think. When you change the way you think, listen, you change your perspective. And sometimes in our lives only, all we need is to change our perspective. All you need to do is change your perspective about your two daughters. Because you're seeing from this one dimension 
But God wants you to see this other dimension that you don't see. God wants you to see not what you see. God wants you to see what he sees. And when we see what God sees, and we change our perspective as a result of changing the way we think, growth begins to happen. But so many of us, our perspective is askew, is offset, is off focus. Church, I love you. And I want you to grow. So because of that, I'm not always going to tell you things that you want to hear that much. I'm going to tell you things that you need to hear. Because my desire is that you develop and you grow in everything you will discuss or that you change your perspective of what God wants you to see. Galatians 3.3 says, You begin your life in Christ by the Spirit. Now you are trying to make it complete by your own power. That is foolish. That is madness. This morning as I'm wrapping up, a renewed mind is not about determination. Okay, because you say, well, I'm going to renew my mind. I'm going to be so determined. I, I, I made up my mind. I'm going to change. Stop stop because it's not in your own power this re- this changing your mind the changing the way you think it's a determined dependence on God it's saying God I'm going to depend on you on everything that I do in the way I relate to my wife in the way I relate to my children in the way I handle my finances in the way I do everything that I do I will depend on you Lord It's determined dependence on God's grace because there is power when we rely on His grace. Let me ask you to please stand on your feet. Church, we were saved by grace and we are continuing to grow in grace. You may say, Pastor, I'm struggling right now. Everyone around me is doing great, but I'm struggling. My friends, if that is your case, let me remind you with the words and encourage you with the words that Paul wrote to the Philippians. And he told them in, 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 in Philippians 1.6. And I'm reading it to you. And it says, He who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. If if, if the Lord began something in your life, He will see that it is complete. You can be assured of that. You can take that promise to the bank and you know that God, what He promises, He keeps. Are you struggling? Is there something hindering you right now? Don't try to do it in your own power. Allow God's grace in your intimate moments with God. Say, God, I need your grace. Father, give me your grace. Can you you close your eyes? I'm going to wrap up right now. God, I need your grace. In 10, 15 years from now, I want to make sure that if I see some of you, whether you're my age or you're younger, that we can reference this period in our life and say I am here because I was able to allow the grace of God to change me I was able to rid myself of the old and I was able to put on the new as I was renewed in my mind by the grace of Christ if you are struggling allow the grace of God to empower you and to move in the right direction 
It is not in your own strength. It is because of what God has done for us. The Bible says in the very final book, in the Revelation, it says that he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the beginning and the end. And the Bible says that we are hidden in Christ. So if we are hidden in Christ, we had a beginning and we will see the end come to fruition by the grace of Christ. Can I pray for you this morning? Father, thank you for this beautiful congregation of people that have come and we all have a need to grow in grace and to be able to be changed by your power. I ask you that you help my brother who is struggling, perhaps with an addiction, my brother who's struggling perhaps with the way that he speaks or a sister who feels weak at different times in her life or maybe someone else that is struggling father with what they see we ask you that you will help us grow in your grace let us not see from our perspective but let us see from your perspective to rid ourselves of sin and anything that entangles us and that we run the race that you have set before us. Let your joy become our strength in everything that we do. And that we leave this place and we face tomorrow's challenges with the grace of God. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to come to this house of worship, to lift up your name, and to receive your words, teachings, to give us guidance, to give us growth in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Bless you. You have a great rest of the day.